everybody. Welcome to Recovery Alive. We are so excited that you are here. We feel like God is going to do something amazing in your life today. I just believe that with all my heart. So I just want to let you guys know that we want to make sure that this is a safe place for you to find hope and healing. We invite you to share this, start a watch party, make sure that you're letting people know that this truly is a place where God is doing some amazing work. Let everybody know about it. We love you guys. As you could have chosen anything to be doing right now, but you decided to kind of hang out with us. So we're so, so glad that you did. Enjoy this service and God bless you. How's everybody? You excited to be here tonight? Hey, my name is John. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with codependency and anger. Hey, I've got a good reason for us to stand tonight. And uh, it's a little bit of a surprise. Come on out, Mr. Ray. Let's give it up for Raven, who is back. Come on. We miss you. Don't go too far, Kevin. Hey, you want to tell everybody how much you love him? How much? Just real quick. If you don't know Ray, Ray's been uh, in the hospital. Recently, got hit by a car. Um, there were some really, really scary moments. We didn't know if he was going to make it. And uh, when I was there, they weren't going to let him out of the hospital for a couple more months. But you just kept proving. Well, God kept proving the doctors wrong. Amen. Yeah, you want to share something with them, Ray? Why don't you tell everybody how much you love them? I want to thank every one of y'all for your prayers and your hopes and your dreams for me. I was in a very, very, very critical accident, and I want to let y'all know that thank you a whole lot because you don't know how much you mean to me. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Come on, let's give it up for Ray. We love you, buddy. I love in 1 John where we hear this really beautiful moment it feels like of just joy and kind of unfiltered excitement from John when he just says how great the Father's love is for us that he has lavished on us that we would be called children of God. And I just want to sing this out and I want to sing it in a, in a declaration. If you're struggling with fear, If you're struggling with worry, if you're struggling with anxiety, I'm just going to ask you to sing this out. And I want you to sing it out, not in a a way that, that, you know, we kind of sing worship a lot of times, just kind of in a mechanical way. But I want you to believe it, man. I want you to stand on this. And I want you to sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Amen. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Sing that out. I am a child of God. Come on, sing it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. One more time. Come on. I'm no longer. Last time, come on. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing, you unravel me. You unravel me. With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till my fears have gone. You unravel me, sing it out. You unravel me with a melody, you surround me. 
you, God. You're worthy. Is he worthy in this place? There's a lot of unworthy things we give our attention and time to, amen? But he alone is worthy. He's alone the one who can fill us in our emptiness. Praise you, God. Worthy of every song. God, you are so worthy. We love you. We praise you. Jesus, it's you alone, God, who's going to build our life. We love you, Jesus. Worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Live for you.
sing holy. our hands to him and just make a commitment right now to build our life on him. We build our life on you, God, our sure foundation. I will build. And I will feel my life Praise you, God. Yes. We want to make that more than just a song, Lord. And the most important thing, God, I just feel like as we've been moving through step 11, that we're working on improving our conscious contact with you, is to know that you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. I just feel like there's people who are watching online. There's people in this auditorium right now. You feel alone. 
You feel there's no hope because you just feel alone, and I promise you he's with you. He's with you in the fire. You're not alone in the fire you're going through. He loves you. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you, Father God. We worship you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There's another in the fire. You're standing next to me. There's another in the wall. It's holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free? There's a cross that bears a burden. Amen. Where another died for me. Another in the water 
is holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding how I've been set free? There's a cross that bears the burden. Amen. Where another died for me. Come on, let's praise him. There's another in the fire. Thank you, God, for the cross of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you stood in the gap in my place. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for freedom. If you've been set free, give a shout of praise in this place because you've been set free in this place. Amen, amen. Why don't you find somebody, give a hug, a handshake, or a high five before you're seated here at Recovery Alive. My name is Kat. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus. I struggle with worry and grief. We want to welcome you to the best place to be on a Friday night, whether you're in the room or online. We're happy you're here. We have a few announcements for you. If you're brand new, welcome. We're glad that you chose to spend your Friday with us. At the conclusion of our power group here, when everybody breaks out into their people groups, we have a group just for you back in the back corner here. It's called New Beginnings. We have a great couple. They're just gonna share with you a little bit about themselves, a little bit about Recovery Live, what you can expect, and just give us an opportunity to love on you a little bit and welcome you. If you do not have a home church, we want to extend an invitation to join us on Sunday mornings. Um, same great people are here, uh, nine and 11, for those of you that like to sleep in a little bit. And then we have two Special announcements tonight, so everybody pay attention. 5K. There we, thank you, Daniel. The shirts are in. They're not black. So we have cut, there we go. It's time to start signing up. If you want to walk, if you want to run, if you want to volunteer, everything's online. Run the East, run for recovery 5K. We're excited, we wanna make sure that we get out there, we let the community know that there is hope, that there's healing, that there is help out there. If you're interested in sponsoring, find us. We'd love to get connected with you, love to let you know what that looks like. And then finally, tonight is the last Friday of the month, so we are having our process group information session. If you haven't done a process group, this is for you. When we break at the end of our power group, meet us over here. We wanna talk to you about what a process group is, give you a lot of information, let you ask questions and get you connected. We really wanna help you just move forward with the next step of your recovery. I got the grin, so I guess it's my turn. Ooh. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I always uh, try to come up with something great to say or whatever, but yeah, anyway, so <laughs> what I will say is my prayer for you tonight is if you're lost, you're struggling, you're hurting, you're just tired. Some people are just tired, right? I get that. Um, I know in my life, we just celebrated a milestone. We had our 20 year anniversary. And, uh, <laughs> and she could have done so much better. I'm talking about several separations and like literally calling the cops to have me removed from the house because I tend to get a little rowdy um, through addictions uh, with me. Um, yeah, it's just we're, a, we're hope and it's possible and it's because of this program. So that's going to be my prayer for you tonight. So if you're lost and you're struggling and you're just burnt out and like I said, and you're tired and you just want to give up and give in and throw in the towel, do not. That's Keep right. on pressing in. Keep on because one day you might be up here yeah. saying 30 seconds of chaos like me, and I don't know what to put together, and then saying a prayer for, a, for an offering. So let me pray for the offering. That's what I'm up here for. But God, I thank you for this offering, and I ask that you would just use it for your glory. I don't have to 
sit here and ask you uh, and tell you what you need to do with it. You already know, dear God, and then it's about bringing people in here like me and my wife that are broken and hurt and, and struggling and going through the chaos of this life and just knowing that if we put you first and we put you in the front and we focus on you and we put in the work and we, we do the things that we're supposed to do with the tools that we learn here, that healing will come, God. Breakthrough is there, and we will find it. We just have to believe and put, put you first. That's the main thing, God. And I thank you for this offering. I thank you for blessing it, and I thank you for bringing people in. I want to see everybody come in. I want to see these seats completely full, dear God, because there's tons of broken and lost people out there that need you, Lord. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Hey, we are super excited about the 5K that's coming up. Make sure that you are signing up for that. Um, you can run it. You can walk it. If uh, you look like me, you can walk it. Um, it's going to be fantastic. It's, it's kind of a recovery thing to do a 5K. You support each other. You love each other through that, that run, that walk. It's 3.1, right? 3.1 miles, 3.2 miles. Are you sure 3.1? I don't know what it is. It's a long, it's a long ways. That's all I'm saying. It's a, it's a hike. Um, but it's just this really cool opportunity to get together, to fellowship, spend time exercising, getting ready for it. Um, there's some good apps out there, Couch to 5K, things like that. And uh, it's just a great chance to get healthy. So make sure you sign up for that. And if you, like Kat said, if you uh, are a business or you know a business that can sponsor every penny that goes into the registrations, every penny that goes into the sponsorship goes back to change lives in our community. Amen. So anything, even if you're like, man, I'm not sure that I can um, do do the 5K. Maybe that weekend it's booked for you. Um, maybe you can help sponsor it. And again, it just funds this ministry and we appreciate it so much. Also, we have a bunch of process groups that have been going on that have been absolutely transformational. And one of the things that people have said is like, I wish I would have kind of known a little bit about the process group before I got into it. Um, or, or maybe you got nervous about getting into it because you didn't know enough about what a process group was. And so right after this service, I know I think Kat shared about this, but I want to make sure I emphasize this. Right after this main, what we call power group, this power service, when folks go off to the people groups, hang out right here. Stick around and learn about what these process groups are about. We're going to give you all the information you need and then a chance to sign up for that group, ask questions about it. And we are seeing people's lives just being absolutely changed through that process group. So make sure that, that you get signed up for that and, uh, or get yourself in that group right after um, this group. Uh, get into that process group information meeting right after this power group. Um, please, please hang out for that. All right. We have a very, very special treat. Um, we've got a couple all the way from Arkansas who are here to share their story. Now, what I, there's a lot of things I, I love about these guys, um, but they, their roots are in the assemblies of God. All right, people, these folks are Pentecostal. Watch out. Watch it. Easy. Easy. You start rolling around the aisles. All right, that's cool. Uh, hey, it's recovery. Um, Love their hearts. They are folks who've been doing recovery for a long time. Their story is a, an absolute miracle, Lane and Marsha. Would you guys come out? Can we give a huge Recovery Live welcome all the way from NLR? Come on out here. We love having you guys here. Thank you so much. Well, hi there. How are y'all doing? My name's Lane. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm in recovery for alcohol and drugs. Well, I grew up in a small town in northern Utah. I was the youngest of three children in a loving family. And although there was some dysfunction in our family in the form of verbal abuse, primarily between our parents, all of us children felt loved. Many alcoholics can trace some of their dysfunctional behaviors to their childhoods because of abuse or neglect, but that simply was not the case in, 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 my, in my home. My parents were quite involved in their church, 
and drugs and alcohol were never a part of their lifestyle. We were taught right from wrong and were continually encouraged to live good moral lives. My child, my life as a child was very simple and it was very secure. I grew up in a town where everybody knew the, each other and all of your business. Um, from time and time, I was, uh, as a little boy, I remember feeling different from all of the other kids. I always felt different. I felt lesser than, and I didn't feel like I was a part of almost any gathering. I had friends, but I never felt accepted as one of them. It caused me to isolate and to be distant from others. And at age seven, I had an older friend who introduced me to pornography, which soon became a big obsession for me. Um, by the age of 10, I had amassed a huge collection of pornographic material, and I spent far too much time in the pages of those magazines. As I viewed the images, I felt safe and I felt accepted, and it was a place where nobody judged me. I could ex escape reality for a while. And this was my first taste of addiction. When I was 10, I had my first beer. I had already started smoking cigarettes. I loved the thrill of doing something that was forbidden both by my religion and my parents. I was becoming a rebel who wasn't willing to follow the rules. And this would be the case for the next 28 plus years. At 12 years of age, I rediscovered beer. And I really didn't like the taste, but I loved the effect that it had on me. And my insecurities, insecurities left almost immediately. I started drinking more and more frequently, and this certainly was a, a big turning point in my life. I also began having a sexual relationship with an older girl. Sex and alcohol made me feel accepted and in control. And for the first time in my entire life, I, I actually felt like I, I was comfortable in my own skin. And like I said earlier, I, I felt like I didn't fit in with kids that were my own age. So at this point, I gravitated towards the older crowd. This would prove to be a bad, bad combination since I'd do anything, and I do mean anything, to fit in. The wheels of my addictive behavior began to spin out of control, and it wouldn't be long before I was completely out of control. And in grade school through high school, um, I was athletic. Um, I spent my time trying to get better in athletics. Um, I needed approval. And I tried to perfect my tennis game and my, my baseball game. Um, I wanted so badly to be noticed and to feel accepted. Sports gave me a temporary reprieve for my self-loathing and my self-deprecation. Another way that I hid my insecurities was through music. Um, when I was nine years old, I got my first drum set and started a band with some older friends. And I spent, spent the next 18 years pursuing a mu music career. And my search for acceptance was really one of the major driving factors that got me interested in music in the first place. So you can see that there was a common theme. I was uncomfortable in my own skin, and I did things to seek approval from others. My high school years were pretty much a blur. Um, I was a full-blown alcoholic and addict by 14 years of age and was continuously in front of the judge until I was 16. I got my first and my only driving under the influence the exact same evening that I got my learner's permit, my driving learner's permit that morning. At that point, they were sick of seeing me in front of the judge, so they sentenced me to a year in the state school, which was the juvenile prison. But the sentence would be suspended if I would complete alcohol rehab. So I was the youngest participant ever in a program in St. Benedict's Hospital. I did just enough to get by and finish up in 30 days. And this was my first exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous. After my release, I managed to stay sober for a year without attending any kind of meetings, no AA, but I found my way back to a life of alcoholic misery very soon after. My name is Marcia, and I'm a follower of Jesus in recovery for alcohol. Hello. I was raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, in an upper middle class home. I was the youngest of three children, and my father owned his own business and was a great provider to our family. He spent a lot of time at work, and I don't recall seeing much of him during the week, but I am still his baby. He'll tell you that today. <laughs> 
Growing up, I did anything I could to spend time with him, even work on weekend projects around the house. Um, I learned every, things every little girl needs to know, like how to paint and install lighting, hang sheetrock, among other things. Um, my dad also loved sports, so I spent a lot of time with him at hockey games, basketball games, golden glove boxing. Um, when I was growing up, I also used to work at my dad's shop with him, and the skills and work ethic that he taught me have been a great benefit to me my whole life. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, and then she went to work for my dad when I started school. A few years later, she went back to school to get her degree, and I felt like my mom studied all the time. She seemed very unapproachable to me because I was told not to speak to her unless she got up from her books. So as a result, I learned to do a lot of things on my own, and I became quite independent. I lived in a great neighborhood with a lot of other children, and we were all basically good kids um, when we grew up very close. We would leave the house in the morning. We were gone all day playing sports or riding our bikes. The only rule was that we had to be home when the streetlights came on. So our house was on a dead-end street, and on the first day of summer, um, summer break from school every year, all the neighborhood kids would gather together, um, usually instigated by my older brother, and we would break out the street light that was on the corner. <laughs> so this was our symbolic end to curfews, and it also made hide-and-go-seek a whole lot more fun. My sister is the oldest, and she's eight years older than me, and we've never been close because of the age difference between us. My brother and I, however, were very close, and we had a lot in common because I was somewhat of a tomboy. When playing with the neighborhood kids, I always wanted to be involved in whatever my brother was doing. As he got older and started to experiment with alcohol and drugs, I would wait up for him on Friday and Saturday nights to help him get in the house without waking our parents. And even though I was five years younger, I started to experiment with him too. I was not raised in a Christian home, but my mother would take us to her church with her every Sunday. My father would never go. I would usually try to negotiate my way out of going by volunteering to help my dad with more projects. It seldom worked, but I still tried. As a teenager, I was insecure and had poor self-image. I was uncomfortable in most friendships, which led me to briefly get involved with a group of older kids I should have avoided. A few days after my 13th birthday, we planned to go to a movie. We got a ride to the theater, but didn't make it into the movie. Unknown to me, they had made other plans to hook up with some boys, and they picked us up from there. They had alcohol with them and drove us to a secluded area behind the Capitol building. One of the boys took an interest in me and asked me to take a walk with him. Once alone, his true intentions were revealed. I was unable to stop, stop him, and my innocence was taken. Afterward, when we rejoined the group, the other girls said that they could hear my cries for help, but didn't know what to do, so they did nothing. At the end of the night, they drove me home, dropped me off around the corner from my house. As I walked up the driveway, I remember feeling relieved to be home. I felt safe. But as I entered, my parents were waiting for me, furious. Apparently during the night, they had discovered that we had not been at the movie theater. They had much different perspective on the events of the evening and believed that I had intentionally lied about our plans. I tried to defend my actions, but they wouldn't listen. So I didn't say anything to them about what had happened to me that night. I felt totally betrayed. I just, I was so, so I just completely isolated myself. I immediately quit hanging out with those friends. I was withdrawn at home and spent most of my time alone in my room. I felt like there was no one I could talk to or trust. The hurt and isolation eventually led me to try anything I could to numb the pain. I filled it with drugs, alcohol, inappropriate relationships, which resulted in the birth of my son. I was just 18 and unmarried when he was born. My zeal to grow up quickly resulted in me starting a family long before I was ready. My son was born when I was 20 years old. My oldest daughter at age 23, and then her sister was born just 10 months later. And although my family was growing and maturing, I certainly wasn't. My addictive behaviors stunted my emotional growth, and it caused me to be very, very selfish. And needless to say, my most important relationships were the ones that suffered the most. In 1989, my best friend introduced me, and, uh, and my girlfriend at the time, to his girlfriend, 
Marcia. We were quite a foursome. We had a lot in common because we had young kids. We all liked to drink, and we loved to play cards on the weekends. And after hearing about a great job in Las Vegas, we all headed to Sin City in 1991. Looking back, that was not a wise decision. The first few years in Las Vegas were fun, but it didn't take very long at all for the fun to stop as our relationships with our spouses and friends unraveled. Marcia went through a very, very difficult breakup, a, a bad divorce, and I was there for her. A year later, later Marcia returned the favor by being there for me at the end of my marriage. Through the years, we had become best friends, and I'll answer the question right now. No, we never had an affair. We were just friends. A short time later, we started dating, and we hit it off immediately because we knew everything about each other. It was just really natural. For the first 18 months, the relationship worked, and so did alcohol, but then everything turned on us. At the end of a crazy drunken evening, I was arrested on a domestic charge. In an attempt to salvage the relationship, Lane and I agreed that we would quit drinking, so I quit. He did not. He continued to drink, but he was now lying and sneaking, pretending to be sober. It felt like he was cheating on me. I had remained sober for just over two years when we got married. I'm still not sure why he asked or why I said yes. Uh, when we went on our honeymoon, it was a nightmare. Lane was sneaking his drinks for a, a couple of days until I finally told him to bring me whatever it was that he was drinking. We drank together for the next three days of the trip, and it was awful. I wanted nothing more than to get an early flight home, leave him behind with no money or a passport, and <laughs> almost made it. I have not drank since we came home, October 11th, 2001. Our marriage continued with me being sober, but feeling trapped as Lane's addiction progressed. Whenever the holidays approached, it seemed to worsen, and 2002 was no different. A week before Christmas, my father called to tell me that one of my uncles had ended his life after getting his third DUI. I went to Idaho for the funeral, and on the flight home afterward, I was completely exhausted and emotionally drained. It did not improve when I arrived home and saw my husband, who, after being unsupervised for four days, was completely out of control in his addiction. Three days later, he assaulted me and fled as I called the police. I hit my knees, and sobbing, I cried out for God. I wasn't sure if I believed there was a God, but I asked him if he was there, and he saw me, if he would help me. Lane came home after the police had left, and I had gone to sleep, and a week later, he repeated the offense, and I called the cops again. The end of my drinking career occurred on Christmas week, 2002. I can hardly remember any of the details of that week, but my actions led to my arrest. And as the officers put me in the back seat of the patrol car, I thanked them for arresting me. Puzzled, they asked me why, and my reply was, I don't want to, I know that I won't drink today. When I called my wife from jail, she let me know that I wasn't welcome back home and that she was leaving me. And as I sat in jail, I said a prayer to a God that I didn't even believe in, and this was my prayer. I said, God, if you are there, I need you. I knew immediately my prayer had been heard. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I knew my relationship with my wife might be over, but for the first time in many years, I, I saw a glimmer of hope. When I got released on January 3rd, 2003, my sobriety date, I took the bus to a friend's house, and I knocked on his door at 5.30 in the morning, and he graciously allowed me to stay on his couch. Each morning, he would drop me off at the local AA club at 8 o'clock, and he instructed me to stay there and go to meetings all day. At 5 p.m., he'd pick me up. And incidentally, then he'd take me to a 5.30 meeting and then a 7 o'clock meeting. <laughs> mm. 
I did 234 meetings in 90 days. This dear friend became my sponsor. This was the beginning of my road to recovery. I was willing to do whatever he asked me to do. Several times, I tried to contact my wife over those first two weeks, and on one of those calls, my wife agreed to meet me at a mall. And when we met, I convinced her into letting me come home, and I now know that she really didn't want me back at the time. But I believe God intervened and he softened her heart. And she gave me a very, stri very, very strict guidelines. She took away my keys. She took away my driver's, driver's license, my credit cards, all access to money. She gave me a bus pass and told me to get a, a job. And she gave me a dollar to put in the AA meeting at, at the end of the day. And then she said, you're going to have to earn my trust. It took two years for that trust to be established. And one evening while I was at a, at a 5.30 meeting, a, gen a gentleman made a comment that changed my life. He said this. He said, in order to truly achieve sobriety and have serenity in, in your life, a person had to have a relationship with God. Now, I remember thinking to myself, I have to find this relationship. I realized I had never experienced true peace, and that was exactly what I was looking for. You see, I had renounced God at 14 years of age, and I had lived my life as an ag agnostic, but I knew something had to change, and I knew just the place to find God. My wife and I were attending an AA meeting in a huge mega church on Thursday nights in, in Las Vegas. And we decided to go to the Easter service. It was there that we gave our lives to Jesus on April 20th, 2003. It's kind of funny, that's 420, 2003. Our lives were about to radically change. In August of that same year, there was an announcement that the church was starting a program called Celebrate Recovery, a Christ-centered recovery program. This sounded perfect for us. Because the church was just starting the program and didn't have sufficient leadership yet, the pastor in charge of CR asked us to go through leadership training, which we, which we did gladly. It was amazing. God was using our weaknesses for his glory. We could not comprehend the love and the grace that was being extended to us. God used Celebrate Recovery to not only free us from addiction, but transform our marriage. Through working the principles of Celebrate Recovery, we were able to release past hurts and resentments and learn how to forgive one another and ourselves. It also taught us how to be honest in all of our relationships. Celebrate Recovery has been instrumental in developing a deep intimacy with Jesus Christ. Recovery has taught us the importance of prayer, how to press into God, and to seek his will for our lives and our marriage. In 2007, God moved us from Las Vegas to Little Rock, which didn't make any sense at the time. We had recently purchased a home, had lucrative careers, and a wonderful church. Things were good. However, the complete transformation God had performed in our marriage allowed me to willingly follow Lane in the move to Arkansas. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Yeah. At that time, we had the Lord, we thought the Lord had moved us because of Lane's career. Looking back, we realized he had moved us for so much more. Several years ago, Marsha and I approached our church, and they, we asked them about starting a CR. And after meeting with a pastor, he told us that the church wasn't ready, but we could start a connection class on Sunday mornings. And at first, we scoffed. I especially scoffed. And I said, no way. But the Holy Spirit had other plans, and so a class was born. It was, it's called Life Recovery Central, and it's now still going on strong on Saturday nights and Sundays. Um, we've been doing that for 12 years now. And... Yeah. Yeah. In the spring of 2013, the church told us to come up with a proposal and a plan for CR at First NLR. 
We went to the summit that July and put together the launch team that fall. Our first Celebrate Recovery meeting was on January 2nd, 2014. It was the core members of our Life Recovery Central group who became our found out foundational leaders at CR. God always has a plan, amen? amen. CR First NLR has, has had a big impact on our church. It really is okay to not be okay at First Assembly. And it's a place where every soul matters to God. And one thing we want you to understand tonight is that our marriage was lifeless and it was dead. It was riddle, riddled with addiction, deceit, verbal and physical abuse. It was hopeless. And then we met Jesus. And slowly but surely, he restored and he renewed our marriage. And for two years, we struggled. We struggled to stay together. And for most of those 24 months, Marcia didn't even want to be in the, the relationship. In fact, at the 18-month mark, she asked for a divorce. But she stayed. When she didn't want to go to counseling, I went to counseling anyway. And sometimes people think that, well, I think we all think that marriage is 50-50 when it's actually both people have to give 100%. Amen. But there are times, yeah, there are times in a marriage when one spouse gives less. Marsha once said, she says, I was given about 20%. In those times, the other spouse must make up by giving more. And the key is to not give up and remain present. Giving up the fight only leads to a deeper hurt. Now, I'm not saying that you should stay in, in any kind of an abusive relationship. If there's a history of abuse, for goodness sakes, leave. What I am saying is God can and he will heal broken marriages. Even those... Yeah. Even those where infidelity or abuse have occurred. We're not trying to come across as marriage experts. It's pretty obvious we're not. However, what, what we know is that we would not have received the miracles from God if we had just simply walked away. Our story is an illustration of what God can do in the most hopeless of circumstances. Our marriage was restored, and it's flourishing today. We are celebrating this week 20 years of marriage. <laughs> Nothing is too difficult for God. So for the newcomer, God has used this ministry to shape me into the person I was originally created to be. He is performing miracles. What recovery has taught me more than anything else is forgiveness. I have forgiven my abusers, my abandoners, my husband, and myself. Forgiveness is the key that releases me from the bondage of my past. I don't forgive because others deserve it. I forgive because I deserve it. I am glad that you're here, and you can abstain alone for a time. You can be sober in isolation, but it won't last. Recovery takes all of us, doing it together to work. None of us can heal ourselves which is what recovery truly is, healing. It's time for you to experience all that God has for your life without any burdens to hold you back. Isaiah 43, 19, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So when we were writing our story for tonight, we were prompted by the Holy Spirit to not only tell our story of addiction and dysfunction, but to emphasize the importance of being present and remaining present in your marriage, even when it seems like there's no hope, to seek counseling even when one or both of you has no desire to keep trying. I want you to hear this. Your miracle, your breakthrough, your transformed life, is within reach. God has an amazing plan, but you must remain steadfast and keep your eyes focused on Him, not on the present circumstances. Keep in the fight. If God can save a dead, hopeless, 
helpless marriage like ours, he can do the same for yours. And there are several here, I'm sure, tonight who can relate to some or much of our, our story and our circumstances. If you struggle with addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, or any other compulsion, you are in the right place. And maybe you've endured some physical or mental or emotional abuse. You might be in a fight for your marriage, or maybe you, you're done fighting and you don't care about each other. In fact, you're probably sitting next to him right now thinking, what am I here with this loser? It looks like it's over and there's no hope. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you don't hear anything else I say tonight, there is hope and his name is Jesus. Thanks, Thanks for, for letting, letting us share. You guys can stay standing, and I just want to, uh, for those of us who are uh, struggling relationship, I want to challenge you here in a minute. Our, if you can put up step 11 real quick. Step 11 says that we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the, par the power to carry that out. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for your life. Our focus tonight is on this core question. If we could put up that core question, what did you take away from Lane's testimony? Tonight, love for you to get into a people group, to ask yourself this question, to make sure that whatever the Holy Spirit is, they were obedient to the Holy Spirit, to share a little bit different about their story, that you would speak out of the obedience of the Holy Spirit. If you're watching online, that you would go into your people group. We've got a men's people group and a ladies' people group that you can get involved with online. We'd love for you to go there right now. For those of you who are here in this place, I want you to believe something. I want you to believe what you heard tonight is that God can do anything. He can do anything. Hey guys, so glad that you made it to our Friday night Recovery Alive service. Let's go ahead and close in the serenity prayer. Would you join me? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Give me the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to start our online people groups here in a few minutes. Hope you can join us for that. The link is on the stream, so make sure you click that link. Guys, I'm so, so excited about what's going on here throughout the week. Make sure that you're sharing what we're doing. Make sure that you're doing watch parties. Um, we're trying to just change this world one more, one more hurting person at a time. God bless you guys, and uh, we'll see you next Friday.